Hi, my name is Bob Hamlin. A famous physicist, John Wheeler, once said, we humans are so easily trapped in our own words. What did he mean by this? Well, let me give you an example from the world of thermodynamics. You see, in the world of thermodynamics, there's a phenomenon that we observe, but the phenomenon and the word that we use to describe it don't match. We're trapped by the word. And in fact, we're confused by the word. What is the word? Heat. How many times have you heard somebody say something along the lines of how much heat is flowing from the furnace into that boiler? Well, maybe not that many times, but if you've hung around the engineers, you may have heard of that. You may have also heard of such questions as how much heat do you think is in that vessel? Or our home is losing too much heat. Or could you please heat up my coffee? Heat is a frequently used word. But why are we trapped by it? Well, because heat doesn't exist and it certainly doesn't flow. We use the word as if it were a noun or a verb and it's neither. So that leaves the question, what is heat and how are we trapped by it? How did we get into this situation? First, let's get clear about the physics involved. Let's think about the previous discussion on the furnace and the boiler. What's happening there? Well, Natural gas and air are combusted or burned in the furnace and they generate a very hot gas of carbon dioxide and water. That gas goes into a boiler. Cold water also goes into the boiler. The hot gas heats up the cold water and generates steam from it. Now let's zoom in even further and look at this from the standpoint and through the eyes of another physicist, Richard Feynman, specifically around the boiler. Richard Feynman once said, all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distant apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. In that one sentence, you will see there is an enormous amount of information about the world, if just a little imagination and thinking are applied. So let's take that way of viewing things into the boiler. While the hot gas molecules coming out of the furnace are moving at extremely high speeds, close to a thousand meters per second, that's about 10 football fields in one second. They're colliding with everything that they see, each other, but more importantly, they're colliding with the metal wall, the atoms in the metal wall. Now those atoms can't fly around like they do in the gas, but they can vibrate and they can vibrate very fast. As the hot atoms strike the metal walls, the metal atoms start moving fast and become hot themselves. Then what happens? Well, there's cold water on the other side of that wall. As the metal atoms move faster and faster, they start striking the cold water molecules and have them move faster and faster. And you can see that if you put a thermometer in there and watch the temperature go up. Now, let's look at this from Richard Feynman's perspective. Those water molecules attract each other attract each other enough such that it forms a liquid at the temperatures we're talking about. But as you start adding more temperature to that water, they start moving around faster and faster until they start reaching escape velocity. And they break away from each other and water transforms into steam. It starts off as small bubbles in the, in the water, but eventually upon further heating, it turns into a full on boiling of the water hence the name boiler. Now, how do we describe this technically in the world of thermodynamics? Well, we say that the hot gas loses energy as it transfers energy to the water. Then we say that the water experiences an increase in energy. And then what do we say? Well, based on the first law of thermodynamics, the energy decrease in the gas must equal the energy increase in the water. Furthermore, what we say is that the energy change caused by this thermal exchange involving the collision of atoms and molecules, we call that a symbol Q. And so when we use the letter Q, we say that the energy decrease of the gas is equal to Q out, meaning energy is leaving the system. That's a negative number. Q out is less than zero. We say that the energy increase of the water is Q in. Energy is being received by the water. And that's greater than zero. It's a positive number. 
And then when we say energy is conserved, we say that the absolute value of Q out and Q in are identical. And that's fine. But what do we call Q? This is where we get into a problem. You see, we call Q heat. And more than that, we suggest that Q as heat flows from hot to cold. That's what we say quite often. Heat is flowing from the hot to the cold. Well, again, what's the problem with that? Here's the problem. There's no such thing as heat. It's not a noun. There's nothing that actually flows during the exchange of thermal energy. It's all about the collision of atoms and molecules. So how did we get stuck or trapped by this word in this way? Prior to 1850, before people realized that atoms and molecules even existed, people thought about heat as a material substance, invisible, but still a substance that flowed from hot to cold. They, call, they called the substance caloric and the theory around it the caloric theory. In the late 1700s, Antoine Lavoisier raised caloric to a higher level. He called it one of the fundamental elements of nature, indestructible. In 1824, Sadi Carnot embraced this theory of caloric as a flowing substance in his explanation and analysis of how a steam engine worked. Unfortunately, as you could guess, he did not succeed in the analysis. And it wasn't until the mid-1800s that scientists realized that caloric didn't exist. And in its place, they put the concept of energy in its conservation. In 1850, Rudolf Clausius upgraded this concept of energy and its conservation into the first law of thermodynamics. And from there on, we've embraced this theory as one of the foundations of thermodynamics. And it was at this moment in time that the concept of caloric died. Unfortunately, what didn't die was its name. You see, caloric comes from the French calorique, and calorique comes from the Latin calor, and calor translates into English as heat. So, even though caloric died, heat, symbolized by Q, survived. Scientists continue to use the old world heat in the new world of energy. We continue to talk about a flowing heat, even though there is no such thing as heat. Alas, we are trapped by this word. In summary, again, the symbol Q quantifies the change in energy caused by the thermal exchange of energy between bodies in contact with each other. It's a difference between two numbers. We call Q heat and R, in the words of John Wheeler, trapped by this word. However, while heat and flowing heat don't exist, they are very convenient to use, and in fact, we don't have any other words to easily use in their place. However, when using these, it's imp naturally important to understand what's actually going on, and what's actually going on is a world of colliding atoms and molecules. I want to thank you very much for listening to my discussion about heat. I discuss this a lot more in my book, Block by Block, the historical and theoretical foundations of thermodynamics. I plan future videos to continue exploring some of the concepts in the book where I talk about how the micro world of atomic theory explains the macro world of thermodynamic phenomenon. I'll see you at the next video. Thank you again.